Peter Romanello um, is um, going to be speaking to us from the United States, and uh, the, the topic is uh, expanding the collaborative influence of lighting designers on, on projects and uh, to, to tackle that topic and go in whichever ever way he, he wants to as well. Um, a short little bit of background, he's the owner of Conceptual Lighting. Um, he began as a theatrical lighting designer in New York City and then moved on to architectural lighting in 98. And he founded his award-winning lighting design company, Conceptual Lighting, as a full professional member of the International Association of Lighting Designers. He's designed lighting systems for over 2,000 residences, along with many restaurants, retail spaces, healthcare facilities, and houses of worship. He's served as a regional vice president and a member of the board of directors for the Illuminating Engineering Society. And he's taught all over the world. We are very pleased that you are here with us, Peter. Um, what time is it where you are? Hey, thanks, Timothy. Appreciate it. It is uh, 10 o'clock p.m. on Monday night. Oh, all right. Well, I'm going to hand it over to you. It's great to have you here. And um, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Romanello. Uh, thanks. I, I, re I really appreciate it. And Philip, the uh, projects that you're showing were, were just absolutely amazing in, in that last presentation. Um, so it's it's very interesting when I was asked to do this. I, I normally do uh, seminars for four or five, six hours at a time. So 25 minutes was like, okay, what are we going to do? Um, but I, I thought that actually this was a really, really good topic about expanding the, the collaborative influence of, of all of us lighting designers on projects. And, and in, in doing so and in, in talking with the organiz organizers of this, you know, I wanted to really understand a little bit about the difference in the market in Australia versus the United States. And, and oddly enough, it was extremely similar, which, which we're going to see. So, you know, one of the things that, that we all understand in the lighting design industry is obviously the importance of lighting design and the importance of what we we hopefully bring to a project. Um, but you know, my experience here over the past almost 30 years is that we're we're still very much at the beginning of of being an important collaborative part of of any project. You know, there's there are always going to be those two to three percent of extremely high end projects like the ones that Philip was showing you where you, you absolutely need a lighting designer. What, what I think needs to happen, and we're, we're gonna talk about this quite a bit, what I think really needs to happen is we need to get to a point where there's a little bit more um, market saturation of, of establishing the fact that lighting designers need to be on a project and that it, it really shouldn't be a, a luxury uh, that is only uh, only needed for projects that are extremely expensive or, or multi, multi million dollar houses in the residential world. We need to make sure that what we're doing is, is promoting lighting design in the right way so that it becomes a, a necessity on, on a project. So I, I did some research into some numbers and I'm uh, <laughs> kind of a number freak. Um, I, I like data quite a bit. And, and so I thought that it was important to really understand the market in Australia, compare it to the market in the United States and, and to think about what that actually means. So obviously the, the numbers are, are general, but, but pretty close based on the research that I did. So there's 25 million people currently in, in Australia and 13,000 architects um, and, and then t about 12,000 interior designers. There's only 12 professional members of the International Association of Lighting Designers in Australia. So that's, that's one for every thousand architects. And, and I found that to be very interesting because uh, the, the International Association of Lighting Designers obviously is international. And, and yet worldwide, the numbers are not incredibly high. I should probably uh, start by, by uh, defining what that means. So the International Association of Lighting Designers is, is kind of the professional equivalent of ASID or AIA or you know the professional architects, professional interior designers, and, and, and certainly professional lighting designers. And, and rule number one of being a professional member is that you absolutely do not sell or supply product. And, uh, and, and I hold that in, in incredibly high esteem because as we 
are going to talk about um, the way to promote the importance of lighting design is to do it in the most ethical and, and, and correct manner possible. Um, so I also put in parentheses here that there's 28 associate members. Um, the difference between a professional member and associate member uh, is that if you're a professional, you actually have to get uh, peer review uh, where you get accepted into the, into the organization uh, and you're a full voting member. Associate members uh, is, is usually for people that are newer to the industry or, or haven't had a, a, a longer period of time and a, and a, a stronger career. Um, doesn't mean that there's a difference in quality, okay? So, so even if you look at that, there's 40 members uh, compared to the 12,000 and the 13,000. So it's an incredibly small number. That number is, is almost identical from a percentage standpoint uh, in some respects. So, so in the United States, we have 327 million people. Uh, and 113,000 architects, 68,000 interior designers. And, and so now with the professional members of the IALB, there are one for every 400 architects, which is still an incredibly small number when you, when you think about that in terms of why we might not be on a tremendous number of projects. And I can tell you that that uh, to a, a man or woman, um, every single one of us uh, that is, is a working professional lighting designer, we're very lucky. We have more than enough work to keep us busy, um, which brings us to a, a problem that we're, we're gonna discuss. So, so once you have that as an understanding, um, now you have to look at who actually uses a lighting designer or a lighting professional? And I put lighting professional here as opposed to lighting designer because I can tell you that I've, I've had my business for 23 years um, that I've been out on my own. I've always followed the, the uh, principles, the ethical standards of the IELD, but I only joined about four or five years ago. And uh, there were a number of reasons for that, but but I think that just because you um, are not a member does not mean that you're not good at what you do and that you can't do things in an ethical manner. So, so in the United States, it's literally only eight to 10% of all constructed projects have a lighting professional on there. Lighting professional means uh, somebody who does lighting as their primary job, right? So that could be a lighting consultant. It could be a, a professional lighting designer. Um, it typically means not a sales rep uh, and, and, and certainly somebody that is not an architect or an interior designer uh, or a contractor, certainly. In, in Australia, from the information that I was able to grab, um, that number is decreased a little bit to between 5% to, to 7%. Now, in, that, in those numbers, I should say, also includes some level of, of lighting designers or lighting professionals uh, who are, are also the electrical engineer on, on the project. And, and again, that does not in any way, shape or form mean that an electrical engineer is not a qualified and proficient lighting professional. So, so I think it's important to understand that, that when I am, am referring to lighting professional, I'm not saying that it's some elitist group by any stretch of the imagination. It's just someone who, who does that as their, as their main living. Um, so when we look at that, how, how do we now make that number grow? to 20%, 30%, 40%. I mean, ideally, it would be a fantastic thing if there was a lighting designer on every single project or a lighting professional on every single project because ultimately what that translates into is, is that all projects or a higher percentage of projects would have, would have better lighting. And, and certainly for all of us that are incredibly passionate about lighting design. Um, I, I can tell you, I am a self-professed lighting nerd. I, I absolutely love what I do and I'm extremely blessed that I'm able to, to, to do it. Um, and, and so that, that passion is, is certainly what drives all of us. I could hear it in Philip's voice when he was talking about what he does and the, and the way that he experiences natural light. That, that is something that you, 
you kind of have within you, certainly. And, and when you, you know, work long hours, it's certainly a, a great thing to, to love what you do. So, so in order to, to grow that, I think that there are two different roadmaps, and and one of them is is certainly more of an immediate roadmap, uh, and and the other is more of a long term roadmap. And and I, when I was really thinking about this this topic, um, I I was kind of thinking about how COVID has affected everybody. Um, oddly enough, I have to tell you, I I am a subscriber to the Epic Times. Uh, which is a great unbiased news service. Uh, and, and along with all the information that I hear about the United States every day, uh, they do stories every single day about, about Australia. So I've been following what's been going on. And um, I think we'll all be very happy when, uh, <laughs> when it's all to some sort of livable standard um, again. But, but it does give us the ability to sit there and say, you know, what, what's happening with my industry? What's happening with my own job? What's happening with my career? Uh, and, and how do we look forward uh, instead of kind of wallowing in the, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do for the next six months or the next year? So, so it does give us the ability to really think about what we can do to make our industries better. Uh, whether you're an architect or an interior designer, a lighting designer or, or a contractor. Um, so, so the four things here, you know, obviously designing with ethical standards, I'm going to go into each one of these in, in a little bit more detail, obviously, um, designing better than others on the projects, uh, that, that is incredibly important, obviously, and then our documentation and, and finally teaching. So, so when we think about designing with ethical standards, uh, as I mentioned before, as, as a member of the IALD, that means that you don't sell or sell, supply products. Um, that was incredibly important to the founders of the IALD back in the, the early 1970s. And, and the reason for that is if you think about it, you have a, 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 a part of the design and construction community that is really in its infancy. And, and how do you make your voice valuable and necessary? Will you do that by being ethical? If if I was brought into a project, for example, and the architect and the interior designer knew that I was selling product, um, that theoretically would taint my decisions as to why I was doing something. And, and I, I should also say that just because someone sells product it does not inherently make them unethical. I'm just saying that that is something when you're trying to, to really increase your importance or your role on a project to where it becomes a necessity, everybody has to understand that you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, so again, I don't, I don't wanna misconstrue that. I know that in the, in the United States, uh, architects, for example, do not sell products. Lighting designers do not sell products. The interior design community, um, they sell product. And that does not inherently make them unethical. It's just what's accepted within their industry. Um, I also think it's extremely important not to associate yourself, myself, with a manufacturer, with certain products. You know, you should always be using what is appropriate for the project, regardless of, you know, the friend that you have over here, or the fact that you, you know, graduated from college with this person and they work for a manufacturer. I, I, I really kind of separate myself with that. I can, I can tell you, uh, that I don't even accept a, a an invitation to go play golf with somebody <laughs> because I just I think it's extremely important to be as as uh, as as straightforward as as possible and obviously kickbacks and royalties should never be accepted um, if you're going to consider yourself ethical um, and 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 with that said I can I can tell you that you know a professional lighting designer your your um, way of making money, your way of staying in business, and, and obviously keeping your, your business afloat and feeding your family is, is through fees. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that should always be the way that you do things. So when I say designing better than, than the others on the projects, one, one thing that I think we all understand, no matter where you are, um, there are a lot of people in the design and construction industry that think that they do lighting design. And, and it used to be, I found here, that 
you know, the architects, the interior designers, the contractors, kitchen and bath designers, AV consultants, they all think, oh yeah, I can draw some symbols on a, on a reflected ceiling plan. I can, you know, draw in a bunch of circles and boom, there's a, there's a, a lighting design. That's, that's not true. Lighting design is, is an incredibly complex thing that combines aesthetics and technical knowledge. And, and I think that the, the, when you look at the difference, let's say between a lighting layout, which is truly just a bunch of symbols versus a lighting design, which is really taking into consideration all of the different important parts of the project and how do we make that the best that it can be as opposed to just circles on a plan. I think that that's where we have a responsibility to know more, to think more, to ask more questions than somebody else. And, and the best example that I can give of that is that if you are a, a painter, let's say, that does not make you an interior designer, nor does being an electrician make you a lighting designer. We, we hopefully have, have more information and more knowledge and more in-depth thought that we can bring to a project. But I, I can tell you that it's also incredibly important that you do it in, in a very kind of um, low-key, non-conceited manner. Uh, my background is in theatrical lighting design. And I was really, really lucky to get a job working with a Broadway lighting designer when I got out of college. And, and you're taught through that to not have an attitude, to not have a... Uh, a, a big ego because it doesn't help anything. And I've, I've brought that into my design practice for the last 25 years. And, and I think it's incredibly important because you don't want to be the person that they you know, talk about after a meeting and say, oh yeah, man, he's totally full of himself. I would never work with him again. I would rather have somebody say, oh, he really knows what he's talking about and, and he's so easy to work with. So, so that, that becomes a really important thing too because we need to make sure that, that we're not creating this, this air of false importance. Um, so the, the, uh, when I say doing it better, a lot of times I will take a look at a plan from an architect or from an interior designer and immediately notice problems, mistakes. And so when I'm, uh, let's say, interviewing for a project or, or evaluating something and, and, and correcting it through some sort of peer review, I will look for immediate mistakes. And, and an immediate mistake here is there's a 10-foot ceiling. These uh, A5 fixtures are supposed to light the artwork on that wall. But that doesn't work based on the distance and the spacing apart. Uh, on a 10 foot ceiling, just as a point of reference, those, need, those lights actually need to be about three and a half feet away from the wall. Uh, so I can look at this and say, well, that's an incorrect placement of a fixture. And I know that it's not gonna work um, to, to begin with. Uh, actually, somebody just had a really great comment and I totally agree. The comment was lighting design should be seen as an investment, not a cost. I totally agree with it. I've also used the, the uh, example before that my, my role on a project is to be the insurance that all of the money that you put into every other aspect of the design is actually gonna be seen correctly. So yeah, I agree. Investment, uh, insurance, anything to make sure that everybody else's work looks great, uh, which that's, that's an awesome point. I, I appreciate that comment. Um, so our documentation, I, I have seen so many different levels of documentation over the years. And, and I feel that, that, you know, when you separate your ideas from your deliverables, that's really all you have as a lighting designer, right? We have, we have our thoughts and our design, and then we have our deliverables. And our deliverables are the first tangible thing that people receive because our design really isn't fully seen until right before the owner takes, takes uh, occupancy of a project. And other than that, it's again, a bunch of symbols, right? So, so our deliverables are incredibly important. We have to make sure that our, our level of documentation 
is incredibly clear and concise. And I and and we uh, we myself and my my assistant, we're always looking to improve our quality and our content so that you know when when we show things, we've even introduced color sometimes uh, to a plan so that something shows out, shows up a little bit more than something else. Drawing things to scale, drawing things with dimensions on a different plan, every little bit that you can do to make it look better than, than something else. And certainly when it comes to documenting fixtures, I think it's incredibly important um, to, to call out exactly what you want with exact quantities and exact model numbers. And, and that is um, something that we, we actually take to a, a high level of importance. I, I think that you know, the analogy is that if you uh, are an architect or an interior designer and you just said, I want a floor, well, there's a lot of different floors and a lot of different finishes and a lot of different things that you have to consider. You're going to call out exactly what you want. And, and in lighting, it's important to say exactly what you want, because if you don't, there's there's too much room for uh, for leeway in there, uh, because I know that in the United States, it becomes a lot about uh, value engineering and cutting things down. Um, teaching is something I have always done. I have an incredible amount of passion about what I do. And, and I have always found that teaching is my best advertisement. Um, if I get the opportunity to, to teach for architects, to teach for interior designers, to teach for contractors even, um, and once they understand that, that lighting is something that, that you can put perceived value into, then they tend to be on your side. And, and I find that that is one of the best things that you can do, even, even in our COVID world now, uh, doing online Zoom meetings like this. I can tell you there's an architect that I, uh, I've worked with for almost 20 years. And, um, and we just did a, a Zoom seminar uh, for their whole firm. It was just me with the 20 or 30 of them. And, and again, these are people I've already already worked with for 20 years, but I thought that it was important for them to really get back into my brain and understand why I do things the way that I do. So the long-term roadmap, um, we need to get to a point where, where, as I said, hiring a lighting designer should be the same as hiring an interior designer or, or any other design consultant. We have to prove that that it is, it is important. Um, the legislative changes, you know, when you think about an architect or a professional engineer or, or a professional interior designer, they are all people that legally can stamp drawings. They can legally sign off on things. The lighting design profession, at least in the United States, is not something where you are allowed to sign off on a set of drawings. Uh, and, and so that is something that if it was necessary. So for example, you can't build a project without having a stamped set of architectural plans. Well, if that wasn't a necessary part of the design and construction industry, then I would think that architects would not have as much work. If we got to a point where it was that level of professionalism with lighting designers, then obviously we would have to be on, on projects. And we need more lighting designers. I, I used to teach at a university uh, and, and it was part of the interior design and, and pre-architecture programs. And, and I can tell you that there is a, a fair percentage of them who have gone into the lighting design industry. Um, I tell them all the time, if you want a good solid career where you're still designing and you don't have 13,000 people competing with you, but you've got 250 competing with you, that's, a, that's pretty good odds that you're gonna have some, uh, some good uh, job security. So, so I do think that it's, it's kind of a, a short-term goal where we have to do whatever we can to make sure that people understand that what we do is valuable. And we, we not only add our own services as a benefit to the project, but that good lighting design is incredibly important and that it's also not ex exclusive to only high-end projects. Uh, and then the long-term goal, obviously, we need people. If, if that uh, low percentage, one for every 400 architects or one for every 1,000 architects, doesn't get better, then, then what happens, unfortunately, is that when they call and we say, hey, we can't take on a project for another six months because we're too backed up, guess what they're not going to do? 
they're not going to call another lighting designer because we're all busy, right? So we need to actually increase the number of lighting designers to make it more of a, more of a, a possibility to get on the projects as, as well. I think there was one other uh, question here. Why do we think that lighting design departments of lighting suppliers with the same design education and lighting design work experience as independent lighting designers aren't included in your numbers? Um, so it is very interesting. The numbers are rough numbers. And again, that's why I said lighting, uh, lighting professionals. So there are lighting suppliers that sometimes could be considered in that. There are lighting design departments of, of AV consultants, there are lighting design departments of lighting showrooms, and sometimes they're uh, included in that as well. The education is, um, like I said, I just because you're not a member of IALD um, does not necessarily mean that you're not good. And as I said, I, I did my practice for a long time without, without being that. Um, the difference between IALD and IES, why didn't I mention that? So I've been a member of, of the IES since 1995, uh, and I still think that it is a, a very good and valuable uh, organization. Like I said, I, would, I was actually in the, uh, I was on the board of international directors for it. Uh, I still think it's a good organization. It's just not design oriented. It is a it is a technical society. Like when you ask what are they, the Illuminating Engineering Society is a technical society. So they are more about setting standards. They are not necessarily design oriented, although there are uh, recommended practices, all their RPs. Uh, in their library, those are recommended practices that do de deal with design, um, but there is a little bit of, of difference. And, and when you kind of look at their membership across the board, it is a combination of lighting designers, uh, manufacturers representatives, professional engineers, uh, and, and some uh, allied professionals, a couple of architects, uh, but, but it is not necessarily design oriented. Um, but like I said, still a great organization and I've been a member for uh, 25 years. Wow, it's crazy. Uh, so let's see if there are any other questions. Tim, did you get any? Uh, no, that's that's all the questions we had and, and thank you for fielding those uh, ones at the last minute there and uh, a fantastic presentation. Thank you. But